Welcome everyone to another Future of Space. Today we have Daniel Faber. He's the CEO of Orbit Fab. He's also an advisor for Space Ventures. Daniel, welcome to the Future of Space. And by the way, a big congratulations for yesterday's announcement. Do you want to start with that and share with the audience what happened? Thanks, Daniel. Great to be here. Uh, yeah, yesterday we were at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, and uh, the Space Force invited us to join them on a panel uh, on stage there uh, to announce that they were giving us a, a contract. So we now have a, a strategic financing contract from Space Force. It's about a $12 million program, which is uh, currently the, the largest government contract that we've won. So uh, it was great to have sort of their vote of, of trust in our equipment. They're going to be equipping government satellites with the fueling port so that we'll be able to refuel them. Was that um, like totally a surprise announcement or did you know that something was coming up from their end? Well, it's the government. So proposals were put in uh, quite a long time ago. We had some indication that it was going well, uh, but we were uh, we were notified sort of a week ago and told and part of that. Why don't you show up and we'll announce it at, uh, on stage? Well, wonderful. I think it's, you know, I'm pretty sure that the team at Orbit Fab is really happy. And that shows, you know, the type of, of company that you're leading and the product that you're offering. So uh, big high five. Now, <laughs> Thanks. Before, before we come back to Orbit Fab and what it does and what's the future and your journey into space, can you give me three words to describe space for you? Three words to describe space, future, uh, expansive, and technological. And why does it matter for us to go? I mean, there's obviously these, the science aspect of it, the technology aspect of it. There's so much of our lives that depends on it. But for you, what is the human story of going to space? I think it's it's the story of, of the future of humanity. We, we've always been pushed to explore, to go over the next mountain, to, to live over the next hill. And that's one of the reasons that humanity is, has flourished so much. If there was a flood on, or, or, a, or a volcano on one side of the mountain, there were still people on the other side to carry on. If you look at space in a, in a you know, bigger context, uh, Earth is so tiny. Earth is such a small dot. We have seven and a half billion people living on this planet, um, which is great. But what happens if something goes wrong with this planet, either something natural or something that we cause ourselves? That that's a huge risk. Why do we why do we accept that as a risk? I don't accept that. Let's let's go out into space. We're only going to survive long term when we think thousands of years and longer. We're only going to survive as a species if we get out there into space and and colonize and explore space. Uh, so it's inevitable that this is part of our future. And that's why I think it's it's so important. The great thing about being alive right now is we get to see it happen. We get to see that shift where we go from all living on one rock to being able to live elsewhere within, within our lifetimes. That's going to happen. And we can look back and say, that's where we came from. I had this, uh, this realization not too long ago that it was the first time that I found myself thinking like this that by the time I'm 90 years old and, you know, about to kick the bucket, I will be missing out on so much. And prior to that moment, I was like, you know, the earth is the earth. Like we'll be, we'll have to figure out how to be, to live with the limitation. But now it's like, we're at that, the, that new book. And I'm going to be like, I wish I could, could be living for longer. <laughs> The, the greatest thing about, about exploring and developing space, no matter how far we go, no matter how much we, we develop and how far out we go, we're only ever going to be just beginning. Yeah. And that's, that's incredibly exciting. And that's the, the success of the human species. The, 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 our, you, the, the humankind has been able to manage the unpredictability and the chaos of nature. Nature and and doesn't have really a, a system other than throwing things on the, on the wall and see what works and what doesn't work. And if things, if a volcano erupts and then there's a bunch of species that disappear, well, it is what it is. But the humans have been able to kind of 
safeguard their evolution by n navigating that unpredictability and that chaos. And this is exactly what we're going to be doing going to space is that we're taking it just to a new level, but it's exactly what we've been doing for thousands of years. It's just that now we're going to space as opposed to crossing the ocean. And more than just more than just humanity getting out there, we're going to take life with us. We're going to take biospheres with us and and bring all of the things that that we've you know, that we enjoy on Earth. Uh, we're also, I think, by moving mining and heavy industry off Earth, we're going to be able to preserve the Earth better. Uh, I'd much much prefer to see us uh, doing those things outside of the current environment and being able to look at Earth and and preserve Earth in a way that we can't right now while still being able to expand humanity outwards. I think it's going to be the best thing for the earth as soon as we're able to mine and outsource. I mean, the reason why you and I, we have a house and we have a backyard and we don't have all the infrastructure to supply that lifestyle right behind. I don't have a sewage system. I don't have a garden. All these things are coming to me because I'm, out, I'm able to outsource them. But I'm also able to out to, to export the, the, the output so I like I don't have to deal with it and it's the same thing for the earth as soon as we can import what we need from somewhere else and we can out you know we can export also all that pressure of extra, uh, extracting resources on the earth is going to be kind of much better and now the earth can kind of become more of a it's not going to solve everything is not going to turn the earth on you know into paradise but it will definitely kind of lessen the 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 the, the stress on the earth itself yep absolutely absolutely agree couldn't happen soon enough absolutely <laughs> so before we get into orbit fam tell us your journey from the little dan that was in high school and Dan is the CEO today for a space company. Gosh, I, I grew up in Tasmania, uh, the, the island off the bottom of Australia. And uh, it's a great place to grow up. The air is clean. The mountains are, are green. Uh, but there's not a, not a huge amount of opportunity. My, my dad is an engineer. My mom is a, a chemist, a scientist. So uh, I always was exposed to sort of technical and scientific things. I, I read a lot of science fiction. But I, I went to university in Sydney. In, uh, in Australia and really was thinking, what, what should I do with my life? I want to do something that will make a big impact for humanity. I want to do something that's, that's very positive and useful. I also want to do something that is going to be an interesting career. And so I decided that we should create permanent jobs off, uh, off Earth. We should start to, to get off this rock. And so I wrote down in my first year of undergraduate a list of industries that I thought could pay for the first permanent jobs in space. And that list I only had two things at the time. It was tourism and mining. I've since added manufacturing and entertainment content. There's a, there's a few other things, but, uh, but my list was tourism and mining, and I decided that I would work on asteroid mining. And so I got my mechanical engineering degree, and then I argued my way into some interesting jobs in uh, Europe and Canada and, and the US. Uh, and then I started to build companies, uh, first with terrestrial mining and then uh, satellite communications and then, then I had the chance to be the CEO for an asteroid mining company. Uh, that was our big, hairy, audacious goal. We did our marketing around asteroid mining. The company was Deep Space Industries. Uh, but really, uh, we had a technology strategy. And we were working on building the thrusters to move satellites around in orbit. But for, uh, for strategic reasons, because we did want to, to go and explore and mine asteroids, firstly, we couldn't buy a thruster. So we had to, we had to build one. And secondly... Even the thrusters that, that didn't fit our needs, that, that fit bigger spacecraft or different requirements, they all ran off fuels that you could never make out of asteroid material. And if you want to mine asteroids, the most important thing is you need to make the fuel to come back from the asteroid with the material. And in fact, most likely we realized the first products that we would sell from asteroids was the fuel for satellites to run in Earth orbit. And so, of course, that was the gem of the idea that became OrbitFab. Uh, that company was... Uh, successful enough with its product. There are now uh, quite a few dozen of those uh, thrusters flying on satellites in orbit. And the company was acquired by Bradford, a European thruster manufacturer. But from that, then I started, to, I sort of continued working on the, this idea. How do we solve the market problem for asteroid mining? No one is buying and nobody's selling. And so after we talked to a lot of customers and realized it was, it would create huge value. Some of the customers can see more than 
$1 million of additional revenue for every kilogram of propellant that we could get to them. That's a huge amount of value. And wow. so that's when we realized this, this, is, this is really worth setting up a business and trying to, trying to build this technology and, and deploy it. By the way, are you the only one on your, uh, from back home that ended up in space? Do you know anyone else in, your, in where you grew up that actually took a similar, or your parents were like, what are you, <laughs> what are you trying to do? <laughs> oh, my, my parents have been fabulously supportive. I, I think they, they made a conscious decision not to give me their opinion when I was younger, so I had to figure everything out. And, uh, and so still, they, they won't give me a strong opinion, but I, I think that they're happy with what I've done. Um, but, but your first question, is there anyone else from Tasmania in the space industry? Uh, actually, there is. Uh, it's a very small uh, island. That's, it's, it's about half the size of England. There are 400,000 people. But everybody um, knows everybody. And so uh, there was one uh, young lady who started working at JPL, and immediately my parents put me in touch with her to, to have a chat. So, uh, so I know of at least one. Nice. So Orbit Fam. It's going to be a refueling station in orbit. I assume that there are plans also to, once the technology allows it, to be more mobile, either on the moon, maybe. Um, what are the big... Is it exactly... I mean, the, the image that I have in my head is when the a plane gets refueled while it's flying, you get a bigger plane and you got a, a way to transfer the fuel. Is it the similar process, but in space and orbit around the earth it's a it's a somewhat similar process so uh, our architecture we we tried to develop a low-cost architecture for delivering fuel and the first thing that we do is we put uh, fuel depots big tankers into orbit and some of them are not so big some of them are, are quite big it depends on the launch capacity and how we can get uh, low-cost launches but then we have the fuel depots that have lots of fuel and then a fuel shuttle which can get the fuel from the depot and deliver it to an operational satellite. And so we need both of those parts of the architecture. And so from a, a user's perspective, they have their satellite. If they need a small amount of fuel, then a small shuttle can come and deliver it and, and dock directly, pump the fuel across, and then leave. If it's uh, if they need a lot more fuel, maybe it's a, it's a bigger fuel shuttle. Uh, and we'll have a, a couple of different types of fuel shuttles to be able to do that. But, uh, but yeah, we, we have effectively a self-driving spacecraft we take a lot of the technology from self-driving cars, and that's what our fuel shuttle does. So if you have the right fueling port and the, the indicators, like the QR codes and things that you can identify and, and do the guidance, then it's a very controlled environment. It's easier than self-driving cars. There are no trees, there are no children, there are no soccer balls, uh, there's no bicycles. And so uh, you, can, you can just drive the spacecraft in and, and dock and transfer fuel. Uh, we still have to, to prove all that technology out. That's the next mission that we're, we're launching as a company. But NASA and DARPA have done it, and commercial companies have now done a much more difficult job of attaching to spacecraft that weren't prepared to be docked with. So we do the easier job, just prepared, just deliver fuel. Some of the rockets that go up, they all go with their different fuels. I mean, the SpaceX is more of a methane mix. Um, blue origin, hydrogen, there's other, China is going up with a, a kind of a, a kerosene base. I'm not too sure. I don't know much about the satellites, but is there a kind of one fuel for all the satellites or are you going to, Orbit Fab is going to have to have like, you know, the premium, the the medium and then the, the, the regular. How does it work with um, the differences of fuel? And also, are you planning to be able to adapt to the, the, the evolution of fuel? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a great question. So the rockets tend to take these cryogenic type fuels, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, liquid methane. They're good on the ground where you can have big chilling machines and, and just keep pumping in more oxygen or hydrogen as it boils off. And they have really good um, energy density and uh, decent fuel efficiency. And so for getting off the ground, you need to dial up that fuel efficiency and energy as much as possible because getting off the ground and into orbit is really hard. When we're in orbit, the satellites need fuel that doesn't boil off because they want to operate for years. And so you can't have these cryogenic propellers. So the satellites in orbit, they use some fairly exotic chemicals um, that, that 
survive long term, yet still have a high energy density. So the most common fuel for satellites is hydrazine. And uh, hydrazine, it's, it's quite toxic to humans, but thankfully, once it's in space, it's not a problem. But um, it burns with itself. So you basically it decomposes. You put it over a catalyst, it decomposes. You don't need a fuel and an oxidizer, so you don't have to take oxygen. Uh, you just take hydrazine. And so that's, that's the fuel that's the most common. The second most common is xenon, which is actually a noble gas. And with xenon, you, you can't burn it. It doesn't burn. It's inert. But you can, you can strip electrons off it and then accelerate it through a particle accelerator. And that way, you get the, the xenon ions traveling very, very fast, which makes for an excellent fuel efficiency. And so you set this up on a, with a grid and, and try and get the flow rates up. You need a lot of electricity to, to do it, but you save on fuel. So these are the two most, most popular, xenon and hydrazine. And so we'll start by delivering those two fuels. And that's, that's really what our, our customers are interested in. It's what they're used to right now. But one of the reasons that these fuels are uh, so popular is because you, they, they have high energy density or high fuel efficiency. You have less of them that you need to launch in the satellite because that's very expensive. But a downside when we look longer term is that the asteroids and the moon and the inner solar system doesn't have a lot of nitrogen, which you need for, for hydrazine. It doesn't have a lot of noble gases like xenon, unless you're at the bottom of a gravity well like the Earth. And so in the inner solar system, and, and therefore for, for the, the near future in space, the next hundred years, we're not going to do very well if we have to rely on nitrogen and noble gases. So we expect that we'll be able to offer cheaper solutions for people to move their spacecraft around if they switch to propellants that we can make from asteroid and moon material. So we've started working with Rice University, uh, working with, with other groups on how to make fuel from the material that is available on asteroids and the moon. And so uh, our first tanker actually has hydrogen peroxide in it. And while we don't expect that we have many customers for that now, there are a few, we do expect that in the future, that will be a really important part of this, uh, this industry is hydrogen peroxide, which is an oxidizer, and then hydrocarbons uh, for fuel, both of which you can make from asteroid or lunar material. Well, I mean, that was, you answered the, the second question uh, that was about producing fuel once you're in orbit, because obviously at one point, you know, you have to look into the moon and asteroid. When you're on the moon, it doesn't make sense to constantly uh, bring fuel from the earth. And as we venture, you know, further and further away, we're going to have to figure out how to get that resources. That's one of the reasons why I wrote the, about the going to space will bring a revolution in recycling because that atom of carbon that you bring on board when you leave becomes, it's more important than gold. You cannot just like open, you know, your, your, your door, your space, uh, your spaceship door and throw those garbage away because they're so valuable. You're going to have to figure out how to reuse and recycle over and over these atoms of carbons that are just, you know, priceless. So you that's, that's absolutely true. And, and uh, we expect to have an announcement in the next few weeks where we are starting to look at recycling on orbit and how we can turn waste products into fuel. Oh, wow. Um, can you can you share a little bit more? Oh, no, you'll have to watch for the fresh ones. <laughs> Excellent. Are you, by the way, are you, uh, I know that NASA is planning on, on bringing the, the space, um, International Space Station down. There's a lot of people that are like, this should, like, no, leave it up or even push it out so that it becomes this kind of, like, mobile museum that you know once we get get moving around it becomes this destination that people can go i think it would be a waste to, to burn it down after so much i 100 percent agree i i can't believe well i can believe that that's their suggestion because to boost it up is difficult there are questions about liability what if it breaks apart and someone gets injured or it, it, it ends up damaging some other space off there are a lot of tricky questions and so the easiest thing for somebody in the government to do is just say, get rid of it. Make sure it's not my problem. It's harder to think about how to, how to solve the problem creatively and really make something valuable like a, like a museum out of it. Or even if we just melted it down and recycled it, right? It's, it's a huge amount of mass in orbit that we could turn into interesting things. I hope 
in the next several years that that, that idea gains traction and, and people are able to figure out how to, to do that cost effectively. But uh, yeah, at the moment, NASA's baseline plan is just to remove it from orbit. So it would be a lot of energy to actually push it out? Like it would, it would demand a lot of fuel, I assume, that it doesn't have on board? Yeah. At the moment, to boost it, we rely on the Russian Progress vehicles, uh, which have fuel themselves. So they, they dock bringing cargo and, and food and, and water and things for the astronauts, and then they use their onboard thrusters to push, slowly push the space station, like a, like a tugboat. Okay. Uh, the station does have thrusters itself, uh, which it can use, but usually they, they use the tugboat method. If you wanted to boost the station, the real thing that you're fighting against is atmospheric drag. You have to get it high enough so that the drag is lower. The atmosphere is dropping off. There's not very much left there, but the yeah. station is big and hollow. And so it's, it, they have to constantly boost it up. The reason they keep it so low is because when you launch a resupply, if you don't have to go high, you can take more cargo. Okay. So they, they have optimized for how much cargo you need to bring and a bit more fuel versus using that extra fuel to get higher so you don't have to boost with the fuel, but you need to use the fuel to, to get the cargo there. So right now it's opt optimized for an operational orbit. The orbit where you would store it long term, it's quite a bit higher. And so the amount of fuel that you need to bring it up there, it's, it's not insignificant at all, but it definitely could be done. Okay. I love, <laughs> I love the fact that there's, we're now at the stage of thinking of the liability and the insurance and someone suing for an internet for a space station that you would push <laughs> push out into space what if an alien a life form somehow you know one day it just comes across and then they cut themselves or like now they're going to sue you know the u.s <laughs> government <laughs> these what are else? the things that they think about and it's it's you know i i love all these new conversations that we're having that before that were not even, you know, it was a realm of science fiction and, you know, I love science fiction, but for me, it was always science fiction. There was never the, the idea that this was possible. And that was my big awe moment, you know, early 2020, um, after, you know, spending 15 years as a solo wilderness explorer more into the nature and, using nature as a framework for personal transformation and telling the story of the human species within nature, but realizing that life was never meant to stay on earth because otherwise what would be the point for life? You know, there are other um, spots of life in the universe. The universe is a living organism, not that I want to give it a, a personality, but it, it has a dynamic um, life, life force. And, just like life wants to connect on the earth, it also wants to connect in the universe. So now from the perspective of the planet, for the first time in 4.6 billion years, there's a species where has the capacity to transform the planet from a single planet to a multi-planetary life system. And it is going to be, I think evolutionary wise, as big of when single cells became multi-cells. It's, it's, it's a bigger scale, but that's what we're talking about. We're, we're about to quantum leap in evolution, and it's, and it's fascinating. I think that's a, that's a great analogy. And if you look at biological history, um, that when, when life went from single cell to multi-cell organisms, there was such a prolifer proliferation of new forms and new effectively new ideas of how life could organize and, and what have you. They called it the Cambrian explosion. And if you look in the geological record, all of a sudden there's this massive variety of, of things. When we go to space, I think that's exactly what we're going to have. We, we've got the opportunity to set up new societies, new ways of organizing. We'll have an explosion of what it means to be human, different ways to experience life. And we take the biosphere with us. We take everything else with us. We, we get to see new planets and things. That, that is going to be absolutely fascinating. So OrbitFab is going to become the, I guess, the Chevron or the X in the space. I can see the, these little fueling station. There was a, there was a, a, at the beginning when people, when Elon started to talk about Mars and terraforming Mars, my first thought was like, yes, of course, let's go and terraform Mars. 
But then after th some thinking, I realized that Mars will never, it makes no point to terraform a planet that doesn't, like it will take too much energy to, to, to make it happen. Like it doesn't make sense to try to um, take a, 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 a middle, middle America village and try to turn it into a New York City. There's New York City and then there's LA and then there's a bunch of little villages and there's a road in between all these little, uh, different outposts. And so what I think is going to happen with the moon and Mars and all these other planets is that they're going to be outposts. They're, you're going to have settlements on them, but they're going to be more outposts and link those other planets that are rich, rich in resources like, like Earth. So you don't have to terraform places, but you just have to kind of make a set. And I do believe that the expansion of life in the universe is going to follow the same logic of on Earth. It's going to follow water. There's plenty of water in the in the universe that we that we now know either it's a form of ice or other but we're going to fit that is going to be the way that we actually venture out and settle what do you think about that yeah i think that's <clears throat> that's absolutely right the um when you look at terraforming mars it's it's all or nothing right you have to change the whole atmosphere of a whole planet that is a lot to do it's going to take a lot of time it's going to be much easier to take an asteroid apart, which is already in a zero gravity environment. You don't have to land on asteroids. You sort of dock with them. And they're full of metals. They're full of carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. We can make environments out of that material. We can grow plants. There's lots of things we can do. So we can take apart the asteroids and turn those into habitats. And there are millions of asteroids, literally millions of asteroids. Some of, them are, some of them are enormous. There's more material accessible in the asteroids than what we can actually reach on Earth at the moment because the deepest mines that we make are only a few kilometers deep. So we can only access the shell of material around the surface of the Earth. And if you were to put that into a bowl and say this is the, the Earth material we can access, the asteroid material we can access is actually much, much more. And so that's why I think our, our future is living in free space. It's not living on the surface of planets. Uh, I'd like to to be able to live in space and visit the planets and see what they're like. Uh, but I, I believe that, that we'll have you know, billions and maybe trillions of people living in, in habitats uh, around the sun. And and then you know, one day we'll we'll figure out technologies to go further afield as well. Yeah, I think that the, one of the big breakthrough innovation that's going to happen in that next evolution is going to be transport mobility. There's There's going to be a way that allows us to travel the scale of the universe demands it first of all i wrote how we will live longer because the scale of the universe demands it traveling to a different solar system when you live for 100 years doesn't make sense first of all for time reasons but when you live for 200 or 300 then obviously it's a different it's a different issue for the same reason that you know back in the days that we moved around in horses and in boats you know it it was a time commitment to go from places to places and also the investment of cost and health i mean back in the days you know the going from la uh, from new york to la crossing america either by carriage or going down to the cape horn or even crossing the panama canal the panama canal you had to portage it was so time consuming and health wise, you know, there are people dying, you know, along the way. And now you get into the plane and you're there, you know, five hours later. And yeah, it's amazing. you're gonna have the same journey of of experience in space and where now going to the moon is a huge commitment. It's risky, same thing for Mars. But at one point, it's hard for us to see the future, because we see the future with today's eyes. But there will be a point where we're like, yeah, of course, it just, you know, you do whatever it is and then you get to these places um, much faster. And that's going to change, the, the obviously, the picture. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're, you're absolutely spot on there. And moving around in space, the bustling in space economy, of course, is, is what Orbit Fab wants to build. And yeah. to do that right now, you need fuel. Um, we also need new technologies and we don't know where that will take us. But there's a lot to be done to, to figure this out. And a huge amount of opportunity for, you know, creating new new businesses, new wealth, new new resources, uh, new experiences. All of that's 
all of that has to be done. All of that is in front of us. So is Orbit Fab right now currently in orbit or when are you going up and um, we'll make that happen? And personally, I'll go to space as soon as I can get a one-way ticket and go live there. But um, it, Orbit Fab has, uh, has robotic craft operating. We have a, a satellite uh, fuel depot operating in orbit right now. Uh, we previously had two test beds on the International Space Station. We built the first test bed in in about four and a half months, which which blew NASA's mind that that we could uh, we could go that quickly. Uh, but it was it was crew rated. It was it was all done to their safety specifications, and we were able to test pumping water backwards and forwards. And then actually, we we became the first private company to resupply the space station. We pumped the water into their water system, and so that let us test a lot of the tech and really get our, our legs under us. So we did that uh, uh, a few years ago in the first year. Of, that the company was active. And then just last year, we put up the first operational uh, fuel tanker. We now have launches booked for the next three uh, spacecraft going up. So it's uh, quite a busy time right now. So you would go live, I mean, you said that you would prefer live in orbit than on a planet. Would you go live on the moon if you uh, if you could? Well, like I said, I'd prefer to live in free space than the bottom of a gravity well. It's uh, If you get out of a gravity well, why go back? Uh, I, I, there's a lot of reasons why I think that, that it's going to be much easier to live in free space as well. And we've learned from the International Space Station that microgravity slowly kills you. It's not very good. But we also know that you can, you can spin something and the centripetal force will, will act. That is effectively artificial gravity. And so we need to be on the inside of spinning habitats and spinning space stations. That research hasn't been done yet, but that's what will allow us to live long term in space. On the moon, you have 0.1 gravity. And we don't know yet whether that is enough to overcome the effects that we see in zero gravity. And similarly, Mars is 0.3 gravity. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, a lot more tests need to be done to see whether whether we can live on on the moon. Uh, it's covered in dust, which is which is very sharp edged and uh, and and very difficult to work with. Mars is covered in perchlorates, which are very toxic. So. There's a there's a lot of difficulties living in a in a, a natural environment on those planetary bodies and, and the moon. Um, with the asteroids, with the material that we might get in free space, it's going to be all built environments. We're going to take that material and process it, and have much more control over that environment. Um, you know, for better or for worse, we'll then have to build our own wildernesses and uh, and places that uh, of nature and biospheres inside those floating habitats. But uh, you know, I look forward to, to engaging architects and, uh, and engineers when we when we get ready to get, to do that uh, and build those habitats. Um, a friend of mine, Guillermo, uh, who now is into um, pushing for Venus because he's, I mean, the cloud city in Venus uh, because of the, the gravity, but also for different reasons. It's closer; it has a lot of things. But yeah, he's pushing on uh, cloud city in Venus, and so that's going to be interesting. You were talking yeah, earlier that's about a, that's a great idea. I, I love Guillermo and the, uh, the the fascinating thing that the atmospheric pressure, the temperature, and the gravity are all yeah. great in that in the clouds of Venus. The trick is just building a cloud city exactly. and getting it to Venus. Right. All these things we're going to look back at at some point, and it's going to be like, of course it was. Like the, <laughs> when, people, when people try to compare the past to today, they like they look at it with today's mind. Like when, when I've, I've had this, this argument with many people when, you know, say, oh, today's migration or expansion into, into space uh, cannot be compared to when the European or when people uh, set on, on the ocean, because like it's on the, it's on the boat. Like you can't compare going to space and going to boat, uh, going on the boat. And I'm like, this is now how you have to look at it. You have to look at what it, the challenge that it represented at that moment. It yep. it was costly. It was super hard. They went on also on, 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 almost on a suicide mission. They had no idea where they were going. They didn't have the instrument. Oh, we look back and we're like, this was like a piece of cake. But that's <laughs> for, for them. It was totally different. And it's, it's the same thing for us. Right now, going to space seems to be so impossible or really dangerous. But in 100 years from now, we'll look back. Oh, well, now that was just they just had to turn the switch on and then that's it. <laughs> yep. Very true. The, uh, there was uh, I wrote about how like the, the, this relationship with challenges 
the, even sewers, you know, back in the days, we, we never thought that sewers was an issue until everybody, you know, until it becomes too much. And the city of Chicago, when it started to build, they didn't think of a sewer system. They never thought that it would be an issue. And then it became an issue. And then it became too much of an issue. And then when they couldn't avoid it anymore, they literally raised the entire city and built. And this is, for me, this is what we can do. I think that life inherently is always pushing to the breaking point. This is, this is what life is. Every organism has the capacity to destroy their environment because every organism is basically eating their way through their environment but they're balanced by other agents that control that growth, either time or predator, but it, we all, it always does that. And the successful species are the ones who manage to go beyond. Once you hit that wall, where's going to be your next place? You know? So, but, the, and, and now the planet has been that, that environment limited and we're going to figure it out moving forward. Um, just want to circle back, not circle back, but when you were saying the the mining asteroid is going to be, you know, obviously the, the, the quantity of minerals that are present in asteroids, it's not comparable to what we have on Earth. But I think that even better is the cost of extraction compared to on Earth. This is one of the things that I've written about, this vision of a battery economy that we have. If we're relying on sourcing that on Earth, it's going to create a tremendous environmental impact to get all that rare material, rare, you know, uh, uh, rare material yeah. out of the earth. And it's going to create a different thing. But if we can get either from the moon or from an asteroid, it's not even a debate to have. Of course, we're going to go and, and do it there. Yes. Yeah, so some of the, the asteroids, um, it's fascinating where, they, where they've come from. The, some of them are, are the cause of protoplanets. So the, the planets condensed when the, when the sun was just a cloud of, of gas and the planets condensed with all the rocky material. And then from that gravity, it caused them to heat up and melt, melt the, the planet and all the, the nickel and iron sunk to the middle. But some of them, then they didn't survive the evolution of the solar system and they were smashed apart in collisions. So we have chunks of this material and some of chunks of, of the rock from the surface, but some are just chunks of this nickel iron, effectively stainless steel from the middle of a protoplanet. And now it's it's a whole asteroid that's just made of stainless steel. And the smallest one that we know that's in a, an Earth crossing orbit is about two and a half kilometers across. And that one wow. metal type asteroid has more metal in it than we have ever mined in the history of humanity from the Earth. And that is in one small asteroid. Yeah, there's a lot I'm of actually, material out there. I'm actually surprised that um, the mining, I mean, maybe you know something that, I, that, I, that we haven't heard much, but that the, the big giants of mining right now on Earth are not more active in investing into, or are they? Uh, like, is it, uh, do you know if they are quite active and, and have a long term vision of going to space? Or is it, I think, beyond, you know, they're like focused on what works for them and they're going to leave that to entrepreneurs? Um, as with most activities, you need to focus most of your effort on what works now, but you need to put a little bit of effort into understanding what might disrupt that or what might work in the future or improve it. And so the mining companies do invest in new technology. Um, they've invested in, in <clears throat> undersea mining and, and some things like that. Um, with the asteroid mining, they're definitely keeping an eye on it. They were definitely keen to talk to us, but not to invest yet. They're waiting to see what will happen and where the return will be. And the structure of the mining industry with the, the big uh, major mining players, they're quite happy to buy up technology and mining properties and things as they get developed. So they don't take the upfront risk, but they offer the payout if you take the risk and you're successful. And then the, the smaller exploration companies are doing all the, all the, the interesting exploration and, and front end stuff and sort of progressing the understanding and, and value of the ore body until a, a major, you know, either they, they go into production themselves, or usually what happens is a major comes in and picks it up. So I think that's going to follow uh, a similar kind of, of path and, uh, and is kind of what you expect. But um, yeah, in, in terms of, of long-term supply, they're also very, I mean, this is thousands of years we've been mining the earth. And so there's very well established processes 
And there are sort of five risk areas where if you make a change in any of these, you tend to have a, a paradigm shift in the mining industry. But without all of these things coming together, you can't move forward. And those are, you need a market. You need to have somewhere to, to sell the material. And there's examples like uh, uh, radon or radium. The, the, the price of radium was so high, they were paying almost a million dollars a gram at one point. Um, so it's it sprung mines up around the world. But as soon as we had nuclear reactors and we had cobalt-60 coming out of the reactors for medical treatments and, and instrumentation, we no longer needed radium and all of that crashed, right? So the market evolutions can be can be a real driver. Uh, and this is where the rare earth metals and, and things used in cars and batteries and the like can end up driving more interest in, in what's available in the asteroids because we definitely find high concentrations of those metals there. Um, the second thing, of course, you need geological understanding, and we don't understand enough about the asteroids. We actually understand more about the asteroids than the moon in many respects, because we have lots of meteorite samples, whereas the moon, we have less samples. And so we need to do more geology on the moon to understand where the concentrations of minerals might be. But we also don't understand how hard it is to dig an asteroid or the moon uh, and, and crush it and, and all those types of things. So the geology understanding is the, is the next one. And then, of course, technology. Um, that that almost goes without saying, but you need to have the technology to both explore, extract, process the material and, and use it. Uh, and then you also need to have a regulatory environment. So at the moment, mining the mining industry is built around having secure tenure over minerals that are in the ground. And that's your core asset. And you go out and do exploration and you build an understanding of that. It, it builds value if they find there's actually something there. Somebody can buy that asset from you and they know nobody else can jump that claim. Right? Nobody else can go in there and undercut that. And that's the fa foundational core of financing uh, mining and mining exploration. That doesn't exist as a mechanism in space yet. We also don't know the tax rate. We don't know where the court is for, for, for hearing disputes. All these things need to get sorted out. So there's the, in the mining industry, they call it country risk. There's a, there's a, a country or, or regulatory risk um, that's involved. And then the final one is financing. There has to be enough money available from investors and, you know, the world goes through cycles. Sometimes risk is undervalued or overvalued. So you have to sort of hit the right cycle and make sure you can get enough money. And it's, it's non-trivial money to overcome the other risks. And so that one is always something that is variable that helps you offset the others. So anyway, that's, that's my long diatribe of what it's going to take for asteroid mining to become a reality is that we need to address all of those five points. So we need lawyers, we need politicians, we need the, <laughs> it's yep. the, the legislation. Yeah. To, to connect the dots and make that happen. Uh, Dan, you got it. if people want to know more about Orbit Fab, they go on the website. Um, you guys are based in Colorado. Um, That's right. You we moved to Colorado a couple of months ago. Yeah. And so if people want to are interested of, because the industry is booming right now, there's a lot of position. I'm pretty sure that. Oh, yes, right we're hiring. Now, you guys are hiring. Um, they go on the website. I guess all the listing is, is over there. Uh, there are. There's also some that it's just moving so quick. We haven't been able to list all of our open positions. So there's a there's a general applicants position. But uh, it, just like you you said before, we need finance people. We need marketing people. We need business operations people. We need process people. We need technologists, of course, and engineers. Uh, there's just a, a lot of things that we need to to stitch together. So we're looking for for people from. Uh, all different walks of life to, to join the company. Excellent. So we'll make sure to put all the links down in the uh, in the post and the comments so they can reach you. Uh, if they want to look at your profile, they can go on LinkedIn. Uh, they can follow you, uh, follow the company. And we know Anna, who started as an uh, intern and now is going to be working. She's a, an amazing woman. Uh, she just yeah. sent me, she just sent me recently her concept for the space hotel was like a super interesting. Um, she's a, a wonderful person. Yeah, we, we've had great luck with our interns. We've had some absolutely brilliant ones. Anna is one of those. But uh, yeah, also also encourage anyone who's who's at university um, apply for internships. Orbit Fab and there's a lot of other companies doing interesting things these days. That is a great way to get into the space industry and work on some great projects. When is the big announcement so that we can uh, put it on the calendar and just make sure that we are we are oh. The the, the next the next big announcement, we, we have a lot of things we're doing. And a couple of months ago, we announced that we had a big contract to sell fuel in space. That's probably going to be our biggest announcement uh, for, for quite a while. But no, we, we have a small announcement about uh, starting to work on, on uh, 
a recycling uh, and those okay. types of things. Um, that'll be coming out in in a couple of weeks. I don't know that we've got a date set for it, but uh, someone was writing a press release this morning, so it should be out soon. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward. Dan, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to catching up in, uh, in real life uh, again soon. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Same. All right. Bye.